Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Vicki Sorber of NSET2, and we want to welcome you to our Corporate Open Innovation Webinar Series. Uh, today we're going to uh, discuss the practical insights of uh, corporate venture capital from the author of the book, Masters of Corporation, of Corporate Venture Capital, uh, Andrew Romans. Um, about our series, um, we really offer practical insights for corporate practitioners about their experiences in uh, corporate venturing, open innovation, research and development, and tech scouting. And we're going to have some discussion about uh, where the corporate innovation models are, where they're heading, what's working, what needs realignment. And on each webinar, you're going to hear from leading corporate practitioners who talk about their experiences and insights as we explore the fast-moving innovation enterprise at all of our leading Fortune 500 companies. We have some upcoming webinars after today. Uh, on January 24th, we'll be talking about the active marketing of university intellectual property to Fortune 500 companies. We have an IP to startup program which, in which we solicit intellectual property from universities, from our university network, and then uh, show that to our corporate membership, who then vet that technology for perhaps development of a startup or perhaps licensing. We also continue with our open innovation series on February 14, Valentine's Day, and you're welcome to watch any of the archived webinars that we have on our YouTube channel at inset2.org. So please visit that for any of our past webinars that you may have missed. As we go forward today, you may have questions for our speaker and the Q&A will be held at the end and you'll be able to type your questions into the question box on your webinar panel. So you can do that at the end of the discussion today and have your questions answered by the author. If you want to go back and look at any of today's uh, information, it will be available within 24 to 48 hours after the webinar concludes. And again, you can go to the inset2.org YouTube channel in order to view that information. So today's webinar, as I said earlier, is on practical insights uh, from the author of Masters of Corporate Venture Capital. Uh, we'll get into that in just a second. Our featured speaker, Andrew Romans, is the author of that book. He'll be interviewed by Dr. Glenn Vonk of Inset2. And Glenn is going to take us through a little bit about Inset2 so that you have a background about who the national uh, about the National Council of Entrepreneurial Tech Transfer. Thanks, Vicki. Get in the next slide, please. So uh, I'll be going through this fairly quickly. I, I know many of you have heard it before. If you have questions about it or want some clarifications, uh, please ask a question or uh, email us. So next slide, please. Over the past three years or so, NSET2 has been uh, looking at how uh, university and federal research is commercialized uh, in the United States. Uh, this has uh, been an extensive dialogue with universities, federal labs, startups, and corporate uh, individuals and investors. Uh, it's shown in this diagram here, which has been vetted both on the East and West Coast uh, at centers of innovation across the country. Basically, you have uh, federal research, university research that gets commercialized uh, through often university startups. And we uh, know that startups that are affiliated with universities tend to be much more successful. One of the uh, issues that we identified early on was that um, university startups uh, are, uh, are, are often very promising, but they have difficulty attracting the kind of investment they need to progress rapidly. And on the corporate side, the corporates often can't find the startups that align with their strategic needs. So for that reason, NSET2 created the Corporate Commercialization Council, which is a place for them to interact and, and um, uh, create those alignments. Often uh, the startups are, in, are at an early stage, so they can access either public or private funding, uh, and we can assist them with that through our startup development program. And uh, 
that will ultimately lead either to an IPO or to a commercialization event with a business unit of an existing corporate entity. So um, that's the commercialization model that we use. Next slide, please. Uh, again, there's $137 billion in research, which provides fertile ground for the development of startups. Uh, and we believe this is an excellent uh, opportunity for corporates uh, to leverage their resources uh, with this external investment. Uh, we uh, have many Fortune 500 mem members and uh, startup development officers who are often past entrepreneurs, our senior corporate executives who perhaps have retired or are in other roles, who will partner with university startups to develop and fund those startups. Next slide, please. Uh, the advantages. Uh, for uh, corporates, our early and expanded access to intellectual property and triple vetted startups from 200 plus universities nationwide. And we say triple vetted because they're vetted uh, by the university, by our corporate partners, and also by the startup development officers. This is uh, done with a cost effective screening process designed for efficient use of the organization's time. And we believe that you can do this within just a few minutes per startup. This creates sustained competitive advantage by aligning, accelerating, and streamlining uh, external technology efforts uh, so that they align with corporate strategy and also by leveraging uh, public and private investment uh, to develop the startups that you care about, uh, again, in alignment with those strategic initiatives. Next slide, please. Uh, again, it works in... Um, this way that universities send us uh, intellectual property that they identify as promising and uh, startups as well. That uh, intellectual property is packaged by technical area or sub area and presented to corporates according to their preferred interests. Uh, corporate members, again, can effectively and efficiently review and score it. Uh, approximately 500 uh, startups and pieces of intellectual property are shared annually. Uh, NSET2 and SDOs then can lead development of the promising startups and take intellectual property and create a startup around it as it's identified by the corporates. Uh, often corporates and SDOs or startup development officers will partner to develop milestones that are aligned with those corporate uh, goals and that helps uh, improve the efficiency for everybody. But corporates can receive quarterly milestone reports of startups that are developed or at a frequency that they specify. Next slide, please. So if you want to know more about uh, becoming a corporate member and uh, participating uh, in this program to identify promising intellectual property and startups that are aligned with your strategic initiatives, email us at membership at mset2.org. Next slide, please. So uh, once again, I'd like to uh, thank Andrew for uh, coming on as our speaker, and I'm very excited about this, uh, this um, subject. Uh, has high interest, and um, I would just like to begin by asking uh, Andrew to tell us about himself. Sure, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm an entrepreneur. I've I've had startups throughout most of my life. Um, I my first startup that was venture backed. I started in 1997. So I've been fundraising for my own startups going back that far. Um, Along the way, I've had one IPO on the NASDAQ. I've had one good M&A trade sale. And um, I had an IPO that got pulled right when the dot-com bubble blew up and burst. So, you know, kind of the first half of my life was being an entrepreneur. Um, I then spent about 10 years helping startups raise funding. So I was being paid like a dirty investment banker on raising VC funds for startups from all over the place, from Israel to across Europe to the United States. And then um, I co-founded Rubicon Venture Capital with Joshua Siegel, where Joshua runs our New York City office, I run our San Francisco office, and we're investing out of our second VC fund. We're actually still taking in LP money for that. We've already invested in seven companies out of the new fund, 25 companies in fund one. So we're fairly active venture capital investors um, at Rubicon Venture Capital. Oh, thanks, Andrew. Um, let me ask you, uh, what was the motivation for writing a book on corporate venture capital? For yeah, I, think, I think that um, I try to focus my main objective in business is to add value to the startup. So not only is there value in the cash that we 
wired to them when we're buying stock in the company, but what can we do to actually be a, a valuable investor? I think if, if you develop your reputation as the guy who really helps the startup, who has a network of connections that can <clears throat> help them with everything from raising more capital to getting revenue from customers, you know, then, then that's a good VC. And um, I experienced corporate venture capital when I raised money from Lucent for my own startup when I was a CEO. And the opportunity for a startup to partner with a huge corporation is both attractive and dangerous. You know, you're, you know, you have startup speed and you've got slow corporate speed. You know, it's kind of like you can get hurt if you're dancing with an elephant and the large corporate can almost crush the startup. But if they become a customer and it brings a lot of revenue or if they can become a distribution partner and they're selling your products or services to all of their customers around the world, then you're really tapping into the holy grail. So the opportunity for the startup to partner with a corporate is quite significant. And then on the other hand, for the large corporation, I think most you know, CEOs, you know, a 200 year old Japanese company, they're almost the opposite of Jeff Bezos from Amazon, who's constantly changing. And so for them to access external innovation and bring it internally to adapt to a changing world, it's a huge opportunity for them. So there's almost a limitless set of reasons why a corporation should have access to what startups are doing. Um, and so that really was the key motivation. The other thing was that um, I had to cut the chapter on CBC for my first book, which was too long. And McGraw-Hill helped me edit that down. So I thought CBC would be a logical second book. And then Huawei from China asked me if I would advise them on setting up their CBC. And I accepted that you know, opportunity and I said, I will, for you guys in China, I'll interview the top 20 CBCs, all of whom I know, and I'll ask them how they do everything from investment committee to the balance of strategic or financial returns and all the details of how they do it, compensation, staffing, geographies, everything. And I'll submit these 20 case studies to Huawei with my own recommendations. And I decided to go further and I ended up interviewing over 100 CBCs. And I was developing my network beyond the ones I already knew. And so I met a whole bunch of CBCs that I did not know before. And I actually learned a lot. I kind of thought I knew everything, but I learned a lot you know, in that process. And the learning continues because I continue to advise corporations on their open innovation programs. And so every day, you know, I'm learning more about this very complicated topic. It's actually super complex. Thank you, Andrew. Um, in your travels, I'm curious, uh, what's your sense of what makes a startup attractive to a CBC? What are you looking for? Well, I think that you know, a financial VC is just looking for a financial return. You know, there may be, they might have some ulterior motives to uh, please one of their corporate LPs, perhaps. But in general, um, the financial VC is making the money on a management fee and carry the profit of the fund's investments. And so financial VCs are just purely driven by uh, a financial return. Whereas the corporates, the corporates are often uh, primarily motivated by strategic return, so strategic value. Um, so I just got back last night from New York City where I'm advising Nissan, Renault, and Mitsubishi with Alliance Ventures, and they've announced a $200 million a year fund for five years. So they've got $1 billion to invest in startups. And for them, they're concerned about how the automotive industry is completely changing. Do young people who live in cities want to own a car, or do they want to just, you know, uh, sit in an Uber or, you know, for, for car ride sharing, or Will they be autonomous? Um, how will they be paid for? What will insurance look like? There's so much change in that industry um, that they should all, if they ignore what's happening in startups, I think that they're frankly gonna go bankrupt. So large companies that are not paying attention to startup world are gonna go bankrupt. And the obvious thing is to be 
active investors and lots of VC funds, so a fund of funds approach, and then direct investing when you can partner a business unit with that startup. And um, so there's a million reasons why corporates should be doing this. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, I'd say the intelligence about what the market is going to be needing and what technology opportunities are there uh, would be one reason for uh, a corporate to start a venture capital organization within. Uh, what would some of the other reasons be? Well, they tend to either be offensive offense or defense type moves, um, you know, driving each one of them. Getting access to a steady stream of business intelligence that's related to your core products and services that you sell or peripheral ones, or even if you're a large corporation and you employ 100,000 or more people, um, you, can, you should actually look beyond the products and services that you sell and change that's happening around that. Um, the, so business intelligence, a steady stream of licensing opportunities, of finding external technology and bringing that external technology into internal to the company. Usually, you know, your R and D, you know, your R and D people in a cubicle in Shenzhen, China, are never going to invent the next iPad. You know that Steve Jobs was stealing everything from outside of Apple and then copying it, ripping other people off, and then releasing that as an Apple product. Um, you know, companies like Apple and Amazon are much better at constant change than some 200-year-old corporation, you know, from anywhere. So the ultimately, the steady stream of partnerships with the startups can lead to increasing revenues and decreasing costs and diversifying your products and services and ultimately driving mergers and acquisitions. So CBC is a great tool to have your strategy department say, this is our business today. We're number one in a declining market. We have to change or else we're just gonna go down and down and down. And so they can identify a market they wanna get into, start investing in VCs that focus on that, get total market intelligence about it, and then ultimately buy startups. So CBC leads and juices the M&A effort. And over time with M&A, they can diversify into different businesses like an Amazon or an Apple, and they can generate reoccurring multi-billion dollar revenue streams. Um, whereas if they try to do everything internally and organically, um, they're simply not going to benefit from all this stuff that's happening. Right. Thank you. And we certainly sense a uh, trend to doing more and more outside and leveraging external investment. Um, one question I would have is um, how the CBC fits into open innovation and whether whether all corporates should have a CBC. Um, what advice would you give to them if they were thinking of starting one? Well, I think every corporate has got different opportunities and problems and challenges. I mean, some companies are like Time magazine where they literally have 70 print publications with an advertising model. That company is going bankrupt. It's in the process of heading into bankruptcy. If they don't figure out how to get onto mobile phones and a whole new business model, they will die. So for them, it's, it's like they've identified that they are basically blockbuster video about to become assassinated by Netflix and Amazon. So for a company like that, they need to urgently diversify their business into something different. Um, for other companies that are some Southeast Asian conglomerate, their problem is they've got $6 billion of EBITDA, and the previous year they had $4 billion of EBITDA, and their M&A department is running out of ideas of who to acquire. So, you know, a company like that has got a totally different set of drivers. But I outline, um, the reasons why. I asked all 100 CBCs, why do you do this? And I wrote down the list of answers they gave me. And I put that in the first chapter of the book to say, these are the reasons. I think you can basically read off of that like a menu and say, which one of these fit the needs, the unique needs of our corporation? Are you Time Magazine or are you the exploding EBITDA guy from Asia? Um, and then make your list of objectives. Have the CEO say, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it. And then all the decisions you make after that um, should be going, pointing back to achieving these goals. 
So make a very clear set of goals and objectives, and then the decisions will flow. For some companies, it makes sense to have um, investment professionals that work at that company. The corporate venture capital um, team becomes a business unit, and it can be run alongside corporate development, M&A. Some of them actually combine the two, which I think is a big mistake. Um, but, but I think that not every corporation needs to make direct investments and brand it as the same name of the corporation. Another thing that just seems obvious to all these corporates is they want to call it Verizon Wireless Ventures. I think that's a very stupid name because if you're a startup and you take investment from Verizon Wireless Ventures, you're going to end your ability to do business with Sprint, AT&T Wireless, and T-Mobile. So these companies are at war with each other, and Verizon should call themselves like new media ventures or something that doesn't say Verizon on it. So I think that um, most corporates do call themselves the same name of their corporate, which they think is positive. And in some cases, it is positive, but in most cases, that's actually negative. I think that the choices are you can um, do direct investing. Um, you can also do fund of funds investing where you invest into Sequoia, Benchmark, Kleiner Perkins, Rubicon Venture Capital, and then access all of your objectives, kind of your chapter one goals, by being investors in VC funds that have access to the deal flow. So a good startup probably does not want to take money from BMW Ventures because it'll stop them from doing business with Volkswagen and Audi. But if they took, if they took investment from a VC who's raised money from BMW, and so that VC can create a partnership between the startup and BMW without losing their OEM neutrality, you know, that makes sense. So I think that any corporate should do fund of funds first, and then try to get introduced to all of these startups, learn from these expert experienced VCs. And if they're going to do business with a startup, then they can make an investment because they know they're going to be, you know, if Verizon has 10,000 stores across the United States and they're going to start selling the startup's product in all of those stores, you know, Gordon Gecko in the movie Wall Street would call that a buy signal. And that's on good insider trading information. You could buy some of the stock because you know the revenue is going to go up. So I think that corporates should have this combination of fund to fund investing and then direct investing. And they should think long and hard if the name of the business unit should be the same name that they have. Oh, very good. So, Andrew, you identified a couple of areas uh, such as vehicle innovation, uh, telecom as being fairly hot areas, if I gather correctly. Or can you confirm that? And what other, what other areas are sort of ripe for opportunities or things that corporates ought to really be thinking about if that's the vertical they operate in? I think um, Mark Andreessen has the famous quote, software will eat the world. And that's more true now than ever before. So the short answer to your question is that it's open season on every single industry. No big industry is safe from change happening. Like a fundamental thing that's happening right now is uh, dynamic software. So people call it buzzwords like artificial intelligence or machine learning. But if you look at any value chain of how things are done today, like how does a human get a mortgage in the United States? Or how do they refinance an existing mortgage? That there's a person who does something and they hand it over to another person who does something. Another person does something. At this point, we can make software that's connected to the internet that can do the job of the human and it'll check your credit cards. It'll check your bank balance. It'll have an algorithm that tells it how to interpret what it just checked. And you can take a person whose salary was $100,000, maybe fully burdened was 120, 140 K with payroll tax and a chair and everything and replace it with a computer. And now instead of it taking 47 days to get a mortgage, a startup writes some software and does the job of the human. That woman or that guy no longer has to be paid. And so it's saving money for the corporation. 
and ultimately you can get the mortgage almost instantaneously from your phone. So that's a simple example, but it would apply to everything. Agricultural technology, financial services, um, like a telecom operator who has the business model of charging you, Glenn, monthly for data and minutes and SMS is a stupid business model, okay? It's, it's outrageously stupid. How much money are you really gonna spend a month? I travel a lot, so I can hit 300 bucks maybe, but what would be much better is that they have, the mobile internet is in my pocket and they've got a large degree of control of it. Telecom, MNO, mobile network operators, primary revenue stream should be mobile payments and financial services. They should be Netflix disrupting Blockbuster. Citibank has expensive real estate with people sitting there basically doing nothing most of the time. They should be 100% killed by the mobile phone companies. Um, so I think that um, they're not going to figure this out sitting in cubicles and spending their R&D budget. The, um, the amount of innovation happening at startups, the amount of funding available for pre-seed, seed, late stage seed, A, B, C, D, growth capital, stay private longer, don't even bother IPOing. Why should Uber IPO if they can just keep creating liquidity for everybody and raising enormous amounts of money? That the large companies should benefit from all of these experiments that are being funded. And, um, and have access to that. Well, that's interesting. Let me ask this question from two directions. What is the sort of the ideal touch point, the ideal point for a CVC to do an investment in a startup? Well, I think that, um, first of all, most CVCs are being run very badly. So the, 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 the role models are basically negative. Um, and it, some are being run very, very well but most of them are making a number of huge mistakes, which are ultimately rather expensive mistakes with money, expensive on strategy and lost opportunity, um, and even just purely wasting money. I think that um, CBCs should be set up off the balance sheet, okay? It should be off balance sheet legally. Um, they should compensate the people that work there with market conditions, which basically means a 2% annual management fee and 20% carried interest so that they get upside on the exits. Um, and so that the investment professionals at the CBC should be personally financially incentivized for the startup to be sold for a very big amount of money and be profitable. So these should be profit centers. So uh, Alliance, um, which is Renault, Nissan, Mitsubishi, has announced a $200 million annual VC fund. So that's a billion dollars to be invested over the next five years. This should be done in a way that more than a billion dollars will be returned to Nissan, Mitsubishi, Renault. And not, and, and not that money is just gonna go you know, flushed away like it was R&D. So they should be managed with a, a objective of being profitable as legal entities. And um, so that, you know, 200 million goes out every year and more than 200 million should be coming back to them. So, so the punchline is that there's all these chapter one reasons, offensive and defensive of why we should do it. Juicing M&A, if nothing else. UCBC to drive M&A. UCBC to tell HR, should we be hiring AI, ML, you know, data scientists? Um, but, but the other thing um, that they should do is come up with some investment themes of what they should do, just the products and services that you sell. A large corporation consumes a lot of technology. So I think that most of them make the mistake of shackling their external innovation program by giving them too much of a specific shopping list that makes sense to their CEO and CFO. Um, the, the other one is take a long-term commitment to this. A lot of uh, publicly traded corporates have myopic quarterly earning reports that drive the stock price, and they're not thinking of a five, 10 year you know, term, which is how long it takes for a lot of startups to become meaningful and successful. So they should look at this as we're gonna be investing 
200 million or 5 million or 50 million, whatever the number is, every year for the next 20 years. Um, they should also figure out how to create communication between the CBC business unit and the heads of the other BUs. One thing Alliance did very successfully, they took my advice and they had 40 business unit heads in New York City for an offsite at the launch of um, their CBC, which happened Monday and Tuesday. Just I just got back last night from that. So they, they literally have all these business unit people getting brainwashed by me and others to think like venture capitalists, to understand the opportunity. And as the investments are being made, we're going to be trying to create partnerships between the startup and the business units. So they benefit from this whole revolution of how software is eating the world. Excellent. Andy, we're going to move to some of the audience questions, the participant questions now. Great. Uh, the uh, audience is encouraged to submit their questions to Andrew and we'll post them on, uh, on the page here and uh, then we can uh, look forward to those answers. If you have specific questions related to what was discussed today, please uh, submit them now. Okay, here's the first one. We're thinking about starting a CBC. Uh, who or what level at my company should take ownership of this group? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, if you read, um, I have 50 case studies that are in the book and some of them talk about the birth of the CBC. Sometimes the CBCs are born in the M&A corporate development department. That just seems like a natural, obvious thing. I think um, you want to have the, the founder of the CBC be as high ranking a person as possible. So in an ideal world, um, somebody like the CFO or the head of strategy or someone who's been working directly with the CEO for 10 or 20 years would be the person to launch it. The more powerful the CBC is, the better chance that a business unit is going to work with a startup that they invest in. Um, and that's really the main objective. Um, so it's important that um, whoever is taking the initiative here uh, put together you know, a strong presentation as to why they should do it, they should just look through the chapter one lists of why everyone else is doing it and then customize and tailor their reasons. Like, are you uh, Time Magazine going bankrupt or are you just flush with EBITDA cash? Um, like, Ericsson is number one in uh, wireless modulators. So they're number one in building mobile phone networks. They sell the technology that makes a mobile phone network. But even Vietnam has already got three networks. They don't need a fourth one. So they're number one in a declining business. They, their strategy department identified um, hyper data centers as an area that they could get into. Why don't we sell the technology that powers YouTube and Facebook and AWS type, you know, type data centers? And they use CBC to do this. They, Albert Kim is the head of it and he knows me and I told him about my investment into Node Prime, which is essentially an operating system in the data center. And he's like, oh, that's perfect. It's exactly what we're looking for. I introduced him. He decided that Ericsson would become an, a customer. So they went from zero to five million in revenue in one quarter. And then they decided if Cisco buys Node Prime, that'll push them out of the data center. So they decided we have to get into the data center and stay there. So they acquired the company. So they made an M&A acquisition of the company. It was good for me, it was good for my investors, it was good for the founders, and it's good for them. So it's like a, you know, like a good example you know, of a win-win. Of a but at the end of the day, you need to pitch the board of directors, and you need to make a case, and you need to get budget. You can look at what's the top line sales, what's the EBITDA, what's our budget for IT or research and development, and come up with a number and get um, support for 10 years. Even Alliance announcing they've got a billion dollars for five years isn't right. They should have said it's 10 years and we're not going to pull back our commitment for at least 10 years. Mm -hmm. And what will probably happen is it'll be profitable and they'll probably even increase their budget. Andrew, we have uh, quite a few questions lined up. Um, can I go to the next one? 
Of course. Okay, let's have the next one then. So uh, this one reads, great discussion, really appreciate Andrew's insights. Is this, regarding a specific shopping list problem, how are the best performing CVCs managing long-term quarterly reporting? Okay, um, how are the best ones managing the long-term quarterly reporting conundrum? Well, I think that um, the, the best ones should just say, we, we have a well thought out strategy when it comes to CVC. This is the amount of money we're committing, and we expect that within five years, we'll be seeing more money come back to us than what we're putting in, and we'll be achieving these other benefits. And when it comes to their quarterly reporting, they, they, they view the CVC as something different. On the shopping list, um, some of the best ones are like um, uh, Salesforce Ventures was quite interesting. It's one of the case studies that's in the book. And originally, they said, we don't care about making money with our corporate venturing program. Our objective is to access business intelligence. We basically want to get into as many deals as possible with the smallest check possible. So at Rubicon, we will use about 20% of the fund to diversify into 25 startups. And then over time, only time and chance will tell which one is doing the best. And then we double down and put 80% of our cash into our best performing companies. So the 25 is diversified, and then the 80% is going into the clear winners. That's a strategy to make money. Salesforce went the opposite direction, said we don't care about making money. We wanna see as much business intelligence and understand the internet as well as we can. So they ended up being in Dropbox and Box. They also said, we want to invest in startups that will build on our platform, Force.com. So rather than invent the wheel, a startup can just use Force.com and create something on top of it. So they were creating an ecosystem of companies around their launch. You know, Apple did the same thing with, a, with an app fund to invest in apps because nobody had an app and they had the iPhone. So they created apps and then, and then there was, it took off and they don't need to seed that industry you know, anymore. So, so it's you know, explaining the CVC to the corporate strategy then and what your goals are defining that up front? Yeah, I mean, like, like Intel Capital at one point had 80% market share of the CPUs. So if, if they invest in anything, like a voice recognition company, that increases the demand for you to upgrade the CPU of your PC. Even if the if the you know auto, the the natural language processing company goes bankrupt, if it resulted in more people upgrading to the next Pentium, it was a win. It was a win for them. So I think it's good to have some investment themes. So you know Salesforce you know saying we'll invest in anything and everything with a small check for business intelligence to understand the internet. We'll invest in things that build on force.com that's building an ecosystem, you know, and, 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 and then some of them, they say uh, it doesn't need to fit the strategy. Like Intel Capital sometimes say this is an eyes and ears of the emperor. Like okay. it has nothing to do with I'm Intel. I'm going to move to the next one. Next question. I hate to cut the discussion off, but we got a bunch from waiting. Okay, I'll, I'll go shorter. Okay. How do you suggest CVC should most beneficially? Um, uh, uh, I guess this is uh, work with angels, VCs, and universities. I think I think the not the the logical thing to do, which is what Cisco has done, it's what VMware has done, it's what Intel has done. So many of them is you start off by identifying existing VCs and say, if I invest in your VC fund, will you introduce me to your portfolio companies? And will you spend time getting to know my business units and my, my, my strategy? And if the answer is yes, and you'll share the deals with me, then I'll invest in your fund. And overnight, they get access to all that deal flow. It's, you know, it's hard to, you know, uh, it, it, there's a bit of seduction involved and, and corporates may not realize this. They might think that if they show up and say Toyota Ventures, that everyone will want to raise money from them. That's not really true. They may, they, they may not even be invited to the disco or the party, 
where the deals are. And if they got into the disco, they might not be able to get anyone to leave with them and let them invest. If they invest in VC funds, the VCs can hold their hands and get them into a partnership or a licensing agreement or an M&A opportunity that they might not have gotten on their own. Perfect. And, and working with angels and universities, um, I mean, you guys sound like the experts on the university stuff. Um, I think that universities are an essential element of the ecosystem. You know, the Israeli ecosystem wouldn't be there without Technion and all those things. So I think that's an essential you know, part of it. With angels, you know, it used to be CVCs would only come in at the Series C, so kind of late stage growth. If they tried to get in earlier, the business units are pushing back too much. They're like, I'm not going to get fired for working with a startup that has no customers. I'm going with Hewlett Packard or IBM. Don't get fired for going with Big Blue. Now it's changing, and you're seeing like Salesforce Ventures investing in five companies at a demo day, and they could care less if they lose all that money. They're just getting business intelligence. So they're starting to come in much, much earlier. They're running accelerators and incubators and you know, wasting a lot of money, frankly, on seed. Okay, let's go to the next one. What are the main reasons CVCs fail? The biggest, well, so, so the average CVC really gets canceled only three or four years after the big announcement. So the average lifespan is three or four years. You've got guys like Intel and Qualcomm that never die. But usually a change of a CEO or a downturn in the economy is fire the consultants and definitely stop that CVC ridiculous behavior. So they just cut them a little too short. The other, maybe the biggest mistake is compensation. Um, if I invest in your VC fund, Glenn, and, and then I see you make $100 million personally, nothing would make me happier. Because if I'm an investor in a fund and you made $100 million, I must be doing great. And I look like a genius. Whereas for these corporates, the CFO writes a check to some guy who's only been with a company for 17 years. He's been there for 27 years and his like, teeth are exploding with anger that he's paying the guy. So for some unexplainable reason, they don't like people making money more than they are. So lack of compensation means that the good ones only stay two years at the CBC until they can get a job and get off that plantation and get paid and be less shackled and not have to deal with a ridiculous shopping list and not needing the CFO to sign off on a small check. So the number one problem is compensation. If they start paying people, they might stay there. So the next one's kind of a, a derivative of that, that the CBC is a derailment of a promising career. Uh, um, is it a stunt in a CBC ever a path to senior management? Is a stint in C a CBC ever a path to senior management? So it's kind of going both ways, you know? I think, I think that um, you know, a lot of people just pretend and lie to themselves or lie publicly, but here's the truth. Anyone working at a CVC is looking for a job. Almost every CVC I know does not want to stay there. They are looking to get a job where they get paid more in line with the two and 20 compensation structure of financial VCs like mine. And so they really only want to stay there two years and then, and then make their break for it. If they're, if they're not very uh, talented, they may never be able to get another job. So if you see someone saying, I've been at this CBC for seven years, that's the bad one who couldn't you know, make a run for it and become a free person and be paid for, for what they do. Very some, good. Japanese, some Japanese are afraid of leaving the HQ and going off to California because if they're far from the HQ, they might not advance enough. So they try to rotate quickly, like just spend a year at the CBC and get back you know, but that's very Japanese. Mm -hmm. Here's the next one. Uh, do truly disruptive new technology have a place in corporate open innovation? Absolutely. I think that, um, you know, look, if, if I, you know, if I find a, you know, mobile payment app and then I can introduce them to Telecom Indonesia, and Telecom Indonesia rolls that out across 200 million, 300 million handsets, that's awesome for the startup. And that's awesome for, you know, Telecom Indonesia, you know, to diversify what they're doing. So I think that absolutely, yes, 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 yes. Okay, let's take the next one. 
Next question. Okay, I think we're done here. Andrew, thanks a lot. Vicki, yours for wrap up. Oh yes, thank you very much, uh, Andrew. That was very stimulating. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, uh, upcoming webinars uh, on January 24th, just as a reminder. Um, we're gonna be talking about the active marketing of university intellectual property to Fortune 500 companies through our IP to Startup program on January 24th. And we'll continue with our Open Innovation Series on February 14th. Again, this webinar will be available 24 to 48 hours from today. Uh, and you can uh, view all of our archived webinars at inset2.org on our YouTube channel. And if you're interested about corporate membership and you want to talk to us, uh, please uh, email us at membership at inset2.org. And I should maybe share my email address. If anyone wants to contact me, I can be reached at andrew at rubicon.vc. Andrew at rubicon.vc. Thanks very much, uh, Andrew, for that. And thanks to everybody who joined us today. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting discussion. And uh, go out and get the book if you haven't already read it. And uh, we hope to see you back here uh, on the 28th. Thanks again for everybody joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for having me. Bye.